First of all, thank you very much for coming. Great to see you all. Um, great that the trains are running this morning, which is uh, we were really worried about, but uh, got a really good turnout, so that, that's really great. Um, we are. This is a part of a series of events in public services, and this one is about whether or not public services can become like other kinds of services that we see in. Um, in different sectors, really driven by consumers, by their choices, by, by information being published and them acting on that. There's a really big government agenda on this right now, and only, I think, last week um, the government started talking about using feedback from service users and, and even complaints from service users to actually shape policy rather than doing it from the sort of top down as the traditional way uh, it, it's been. But healthcare has really been at the leading edge of all of that. Um, it's still a very, very young agenda, though, um, but I hope that we've got in the people we've got on the panel today some of both the pioneers um, of, of data and, and empowering people to use information and, and using information and, and choices to drive policy, as well as some, some experience um, in the political field as well. So I'm just going to introduce our panel, and then we're going to... What we're going to do is we're going to have a, a short um, scene setter from each, each of our panellists that will give their perspective on things. Uh, and then we're going to, we're going to open it up um, for any questions that you guys have. And we're going to have a, a bit of a panel discussion stroke debate. Um, first of all, to introduce Stephen Dorrell. He is incredibly active. I was, I was remarking to him uh, just a minute ago on the kind of events uh, scene. He's probably the most active Health Select Committee chairman. Uh, I think I've seen uh, possibly of the Select Committee chairman per se. He's, he's, he does tons of events. He's, he's involved in all the debates on health and social care. Um, as chair of the Health Select Committee, he took over in 2010, um, doing a great job. Obviously, huge experience as a former health secretary himself. So very lucky to have Stephen with us. Um, Sonia Soda from WITCH, the consumer group. Really interesting twist to have a consumer group in a health debate, but these guys are uh, moving into public service. I think Sonia would talk a bit about, about that into um, uh, various sectors. So it's really interesting that organisations like that are starting to come into this debate. Sonia has a, a background in, in uh, think tanks on the centre-left from Demos and IPPR and was also recently advisor to Ed Miliband. Um, turning to Neil Bacon, is a former NHS doctor. He kind of, I, I guess, was one of the pioneers of using data um, in the health service and internet online um, interactive kind of models in, in health when he set up Doctors <coughs> Net uh, in 98. Um, and he's since been a, right at the forefront of that whole internet revolution. Uh, and recently set up I Want Great Care, which is now running a whole number of um, NHS friends and family test uh, data processes across the NHS. This is where patients feed back on their experiences of, of care. And it's, and it's a new thing. It started, I think, in July this year, did it, Neil? Friends and family test. Friends yeah. and family test. Um, and the government liked it so much, it's now talking about expanding it right across the public sector in other areas like, in, like education. So really interesting model to watch. And lastly, um, Steve Melton, the CEO of Circle. Uh, Circle is famous for being the first non-government uh, provider, I guess, an independent provider of an NHS hospital. It took over um, Hinchinbrook in 2011, Steve, was it? Um, and fair to say, I think it was described as a basket case by ministers at the time. But they're, they're doing a great job turning it around. And what's interesting about Steve is that he's... he's uh, had a background in management, business, customer services, and, and some of the ways that he's been turning around Hinchinbrook are linked to pioneering uh, moves to bring insights from those kinds of sectors around customer service into healthcare. So a panel of people that have kind of <coughs> pioneered the um, debate on how we reform services driven by people rather than uh, processes and Whitehall officialdom. So I hope we'll have a really interesting discussion because it's, it's, a, it's a brand new field um, in policy making. I'm going to sit down now and ask Stephen to uh, give his views um, 
uh, for a few minutes. We're going to have a few minutes each, and then we're going to open up to debate. Stephen, please. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to come and talk about one of the themes of the moment, actually, uh, how we empower and strengthen uh, patient voice, patient service user voice in health and care in order to have services that are more responsive uh, to the wishes and priorities of the people who use them. Uh, the first point I want to make, however, is that although this is something that is at the top of the policy agenda uh, in 2013, it's not entirely a new idea. And I was thinking as I was walking over what's the uh, oldest simple, uh, the, how far back I can project this idea, and the thought that uh, came into my mind was of Winston Churchill's father, who coined the phrase in the 1880s uh, that politicians should learn to, quote, trust the people. And it's a favorite phrase, trust the people. If you think about it for a second, there are two ways of using those three words. You can either say trust the people in the, in the consumerist way, or you can say in the more traditional way, of the people who manage public services, trust the people. And, and so it, it quite neatly summarizes the two different uh, thought processes uh, that uh, have traditionally been in the minds of those responsible for public services. Is it something where we should listen to the voice of the consumer? And sometimes we're even frightened of the word consumer when we're talking about health or social care or education or even trains uh, in the railways uh, it was thought controversial instead of talking about the traveling public to talk about customers. So the concept that services should be accountable to the people who pay for them and use them is something uh, that can on one hand be a powerful engine for change on another hand, it can be the, the phrase trust the people uh, can be used uh, to express a degree of cynicism on the part of, power, of powerful interests that often believe themselves to be motivated by the interests of the people they're supposed to serve, but too often get distorted into a whole range of other considerations. So that's the, that's the, the conundrum that we start with. I should say... That I de it's not my view uh, that uh, if you take the caricature of the uh, old-fashioned view, as we might want to, uh, to think about it in this context, uh, often uh, referred to by referring to the, the uh, films of James Robertson Justice leading a, a uh, cavalcade of young doctors round on a... Uh, ward round. Uh, I don't believe even the contemporaries of James Robertson Justice in the uh, medical practice of the 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s believed themselves to be somehow greater than the patients they served. People who joined those professions uh, right through history have done so from a, uh, a, a mo largely from motivation of idealism. They do it because they believe the skills of the doctor, of the nurse, and of other public servants as well, uh, can, uh, can improve the lives of the people they serve. So we shouldn't imagine these are, by and large, wrong mo wrongly motivated people, at least at the time that they start out on their professional careers. But too often, other factors, it's a learnt discipline, isn't it, that we, whether we're doctors, nurses, public, politicians, civil servants, we know best uh, what is good uh, for the people th th who pay our salaries and who we are there to serve. And what we always have to remember is that the uh, people we're there to serve have views that we shouldn't just listen to, but we should understand should drive uh, the uh, are an uh, uh, they should drive the change process. They should shape the service that we're responsible for. And this is the point that's often been missed in the past. They can be, when trusted, they can be one of the major drivers of change uh, in the public service to keep them up to date. So all of that, I guess, is uncontroversial uh, uh, along the uh, platform. Uh, I want also, however, 
to remind ourselves, I think we should remind ourselves, that it isn't just as straightforward as that. Uh, I, used, I, I referred to the uh, parallel of the travelling public on the trains, the customers of the railway service. Now, the difference, of course, between the patient of the National Health Service and the customer of the trains, or the customer of Tesco's and Sainsbury's, is that the patient of the National Health Service has their care paid for them by somebody else. And the, the, uh, the core challenge of policy in tax-funded public services is to find ways of empowering consumer choice, empowering the voice of the service user, uh, alongside the difficult choices people face who, uh, uh, who are responsible for the public budgets. It isn't a question of individuals spending their own money or even individuals spending other people's money. It's sometimes thought uh, that this conundrum, the, the divorce between the choice and the economic consequences of the choice, can be resolved by giving people personal budgets, even cash payment uh, in the... In the uh, best developed form of this, cash payments as we apply in social care. Now, I'm an, an advocate and uh, an enthusiast for that approach. I was the Secretary of State that introduced cash payments into social care. So I, I don't need to be persuaded of the merits of the argument, but what I am cautious about is the thought that that resolves all the dilemmas, because I don't believe it does. I don't think uh, that simply applying that discipline right through healthcare works uh, because uh, it, it, the, we can explore the reasons why. But if you're not careful, if you go down that road, what you end up with is attaching sums of money to individual conditions uh, well beyond the point at which that gives either real choice or real value into the process. So the, the challenge is to ensure that the patient's voice is clear the evidence is available on which real choices can be made, and one of the other conundrums that comes in there is that patients won't always choose the course of action which, on an objective basis, delivers the best outcome. So are, what, what is this service intended to deliver? Is it intended to deliver the service that the patient wants or the best outcome for measurement in international statistics? Those aren't always the same thing. So empowering choice, using information to enable patients to make real choices, and then the other tension in the system, and I'm deliberately listing some of the tensions that we can hopefully explore in the conversation, is that it's wrong to imagine that when presented with evidence, a public discussion process, a consumer discussion process, will always produce a rational outcome from the perspective of, a, uh, of someone who's interested either in delivering what the patient wants at the level of individual care or the best objective outcome, clinical outcome. And the reason for that is that there are two different publics that we're there to serve. We're there to serve the taxpayer, the collective, the community as a whole that pays the service and we're there also to pay the individual patient, the individual service user, that will often make a different choice about the care they want in anger when they're ill, to put it crudely, uh, as compared with the choice that healthy people believe they would want or believe they want on behalf of the community as a whole. So all of those tensions need to be worked through. It isn't just a matter of empowering consumers. Uh, but it is the right starting point. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Asa. Uh, uh, one of the th big th things I always think about, actually, is how far the current agenda, which is always in it, it obviously very much in its infancy, um, when it's flagging up all these horrible things as well as, as all this choice, you know, how far that actually, if you look at the polls, which this weekend said that the public are losing uh, trust in standards in the NHS, I wonder how much of it is positive and how much is negative, but it, or is it just an infancy 
um, you know, a teething problem that, that the choice and information agenda actually throws up some pretty dirty linen, first of all, and then you have to, um, so you go through this pain before it can become a positive. But um, on which note, mm. uh, which might, might uh, help us decide. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, thanks very much for inviting me, uh, Sean. It's a real delight to be here and to be contributing to the debate. I was just looking at this uh, fabulous graphic on the side of the wall. Um, more than one event every eight days for a decade at Policy Exchange, which makes me feel exhausted just thinking about it. So it's great to be here in that uh, long line of uh, events. Uh, let me start off by telling you a little bit about which. Uh, most people have heard of which. Uh, we're an independent, not-for-profit uh, consumer association, the largest in Europe, and our mission is to make people as powerful as the organisations that they come into contact with in their daily lives. And that's partly about empowering people through information, but it's also about consumer protection, both in private and public services markets. And we've got a long history, you know, everyone thinks of which, and they think of washing machines and kettles, uh, and that is indeed sort of what we were founded to do 50 years ago. Uh, but we've got a long history of working in uh, markets like energy, personal finance, we have done quite a lot of work on public services in the past, but as Sean said, given that this is, um, you know, this agenda is really picking, pe picking up pace, uh, this is an area where we're really going to be focusing over the next few years. So um, it won't be a surprise uh, uh, that coming from which our answer to the question, can consumer activism improve the N NHS, is very much a big yes but it's a, a qualified yes, and I think we need to uh, recognise the limits <coughs> and the fact that consumer activism, while great, is not something that can um, operate in a, in a vacuum. Otherwise, essentially, what you get is a consumer uh, power vacuum. And we unashamedly use the word consumer or consumer citizen uh, to talk about uh, people and public services because we think that implies something, as Stephen's already said, about the rights that come when you use a service as opposed to being some sort of you know passive user recipient so I thought first of all as a bit of scene setting it'd be good just to recap on some of the big challenges that are facing public services so we know about the fiscal context we know the challenges that come from an aging population I think decentralization is also a big challenge there are real risks if you're doing decentralization at a time of um, cuts when uh, there isn't much consumer power, because of what that could lead to is arbitrary postcode lotteries. So I think consumer power has got a really important role to play there. There's lots of system change going on across a number of public services, higher education, social care, health. A lot of those are aimed at trying to make the system work better for people, but at which we're really interested in, is that actually going to be the case and what tweaks can be made? Before we get into the debate, I thought it was worth just making a few kind of theoretical, uh, more theoretical points about consumer power in public services. And this first slide just shows the different dimensions that we at which believe exist when it comes to consumer interest in public services. I think it's really important to bear this in mind. We've got user experience, value for money, and objective quality. And it's much easier to empower consumers on some of those dimensions than it is on others. And indeed, when you speak to people, they find the prospect that they themselves might be responsible for driving up, say, clinical standards, quite a scary prospect. If you look at user experience, for example, there's always going to be variation in quality to some extent, and um, people, we really feel that people should be empowered. This second slide, um, I think, is really important because it shows the context in which consumer empowerment exists um, and all the things that we believe at which bring to bear on better outcomes uh, for consumers. And we believe consumer power is key because who better to ask for better services or to flag issues when things are going wrong than consumers themselves? It's your first warning signal in any system. And we don't believe there's been enough of a focus on true bottom-up accountability as opposed to kind of just lip service. But we also think it's really important to understand it within the context of the system. And, you know, regulatory failures have been incredibly important over the last decade, issues around commissioning and market shaping um, and professional culture are all really, really key. And it comes back to this thing, which is there's no point empowering consumers if the other bits of the system aren't really aligned to the consumer interests and aren't really attuned to consumer voice. 
Um, and this next slide, this is the last one that I'm going to whiz through, I promise. Um, this slide really shows for me um, what I think the issue is at the heart of every single public service reform debate. And no matter what kind of dimension you're talking about, whether it's continuity of care in the NHS, whether it's people achievement in schools, you're always going to get variance in quality of public services. Um, and I think... I've sat in so many public service reform debates where the emphasis has all been about, been about what are the people at the top doing and how actually why don't we just make everyone do what's happening at the top or how do we really tackle the serious issues of failure and how do we get rid of them and very rarely actually does public service reform um, focus on these average performers but that's actually the services that most people experience so there's a really important question about how you shift that graft that variance quality and variance in quality graph upwards so you have more people getting great services and it's a very different challenge if you're thinking about something like um, feedback in GP surgery and the way that GP surgeries listen to patient voice, it's a very different proposition to work with top performers to get them to do that than it is with average performers. And that's to do with, you know, sometimes the quality of professionals and the attitudes of professionals in those services. And it's true in every walk of life. You always get that sort of um, uh, variance. And I think it's really important as well when we're thinking about choice versus voice. I think... Um, uh, when we're talking about choice and the competitive pressures that choice can exert on public services, we're often thinking more about that bottom end and getting failing services out of the market. Although I should say that really if it's coming to consumers to close services by exiting, that is important, but it really shows that something else is going wrong in the system. And I think voice is probably more important in that middle section because I think I, I'm a sceptic that competitive pressures, given what we know about the limits of exit, um, you know, people's inertia, their inability to switch when it comes to public service providers I'm, and the lack of excess capacity. I'm really sceptical that there's going to be enough competitive pressures in public services because the way the market is structured to shift the middle of that graph. So, actually, I'll go backwards. So, that's, that's it for the slides. I just wanted to sort of um, close with a few reflections now um, from which about the context around consumers. Um, and I think the context is that we know, so at which we do, um, uh, we run a regular kind of consumer tracker and we ask people questions about public services at regular intervals. And what it shows is that people feel less confident as consumers about making decisions. They feel less knowledgeable and less protected than at most private markets. The only other pri private market that sits alongside public services is longer term financial products, which probably isn't a surprise. Um, and when it comes to consumer voice, we know that people um, who have cause to complain, fewer of them complain than they do in private markets. So, for example, only 65% of people with cause to complain about an NHS service did so, uh, compared to 90% with a high street retailer. And through our work that we've done with uh, members of the public about public services, we know that that's because they feel both um, they feel worried about feeding back around a service. It's a really big barrier. They worry about consequences for you know the care of their loved ones particularly with one-to-one -one services like social care and with child care um, and with, they're also members of the public are really skeptical about whether their complaints are actually going to have um, any impact um, I think it's important to acknowledge that members of the public aren't stupid they know when services aren't really going to take their feedback into account and if you look at you know um, just the Cluid review that was published yesterday there have been enormous um, systemic failings around how complaints are handled in the NHS and other public services so what does this mean for how we empower consumers? Well, first of all, at which we think that when it comes to choice, we need to apply choice in the appropriate way when it's about things that people really feel like they want a choice over. A great example is birth choices. Mums really want to be able, expectant mums really want to be able to choose where they're going to give birth. Um, but we also think it's incredibly important that people have parsimonious, reliable information in order to support the choices that they make. Um, and at which we don't just call for things, we do things. So we've developed three choice tools that are helping people in public services. The first is which university, which is up and running, which helps students to make informed decisions about which universities they go to. We're also launching a birth choice tool in the new year and a social care uh, choice tool. And that's going to equip people to make uh, decisions. But I think we also need to recognise the 
limits of choice. Um, we know that consumers sometimes exercise choice in a different way that government assumes. So when 18-year-olds pick their university, they don't pick it on the basis of teaching quality or earnings data. They pick it on the basis of where their mates are going um, and reputational factors. We know when people pick GP surgeries, they don't look at things like continuity of care. They look at location. So I think that's really important to acknowledge. On the voice side, um, there's a massive variation um, in the extent to which uh, people feel listened to in their public services. So if you look at GP surgeries, for example, people in the best GP surgeries almost universally feel like they're listened to. At the bottom, it's only something like 30%. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, and we know there's variation, a lot of variation in the way that different services process complaints and the way they listen to them. So for example, at which we've surveyed GPs, we found only half of GP surgeries publicise complaints procedures and barely a third of them look at national uh, patient satisfaction data and compare it to local uh, uh, services. Now that's something that if it was a good business that would just kind of be kind of sort of standard practice. So on the voice side we would like to see um, much more professional focus on real-time feedback for quality improvement. There's a really re rich research literature particularly in the US on what works in public services, in making people like they're feeling they're being listened to, and also listening to what people are saying and using that to drive real um, improvement in quality of services. It's too important not to do it. We'd like to see much more transparency and accountability for complaints. At the moment, it's incredibly um, fragmented, the system, really hard to hold people to account. We'd like to see complaints linked to automatic inspections, so making people really feel like if there's a problem with their service, there can be an automatic trigger between abnormally high levels of unresolved complaints and the regulator stepping in. And we'd like a single streamlined public services ombudsman um, that is able to look at system issues systematically. But I would just, on the final note, come back to that slide um, which, ooh, which shows the rest of the system. And if you were to take an example of something that we want to improve, so for example, continuity of care and GP <laughs> surgeries, we know it's something that people really value. We know it's something that's clinically important for people with long-term conditions. Consumer power is important in that agenda. It's really important for people to be able to see which surgeries offer continuity of care if it's important to them and to feed back. But the rest of the system really needs to be aligned to that. So is the regulator going in when they expect, inspect looking for continuity of care? Are commissioners looking at what primary care services are doing around continuity of care? And perhaps most importantly, is continuity of care something that's embedded into professional networks and um, peer review? I think that professional culture in health is particularly important. Um, so I guess that's the, that is the point that I would end on. It can't just be about consumer power. It's not an either-or between regulation and consumer power. The whole system um, has to be aligned. Great. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to ask a couple of questions. If that's, if that's all right, I've just, so we don't have four uh, talks in a row, I just thought I'd open up um, a couple. I, I certainly have a uh, question, but can I ask if anybody wants to raise a question at this stage about anything they've heard so far? No, we can wait to the end. That's all right. Let me, let me ask. It's quite fortuitous the order you've sat down in, actually, because you've got the political and the uh, kind of consumer bit at one end and we've got the, the people that actually are on the front line on the other. <laughs> <laughs> so people with real jobs, I think. Sorry. Um, Thanks. Sorry, no, I thought that's I thought that's what you were just right. sort of saying, Stephen. I am paraphrasing Stephen Mutton. Um, keep going, keep going. Keep going. I'm digging. I'm, give me a shovel. Um, the, really interesting though the sort of um, actually we have various detractors at Policy Exchange email me about the you know, uh, the, even the idea, these, these are from certain political angles of the spectrum, even the idea of holding an event on the NHS with the word consumer in the title, you know, this is not about, cons they're not customers, it's not a market. So it, it's, it strikes me that I don't know whether the debate is even ready for the kinds of things that you were talking about, Sonia, about, you know, people really kind of actively pushing and um, agitating for reform and... Um, I guess that I completely agree with that distribution curve. There'll probably always be that, however we benchmark standards or whatever. But it's just allowing people to hopefully shift between them and, and not have to actually accept what they're given. 
But can I ask you, Stephen, do you think that given last week we had this, or this week was it, the CQC saying one in four hospitals is at risk, um, we had the KEO 11, 11 hospitals being put into special measures, we had the big row over mid staffs in, over the summer. Um, I just mentioned there's that poll that came out this week, the Sunday Times poll that did a um, piece on the NHS think, where people seem to think the public, uh, the NHS is getting worse. Um, are people ready for consumerism in the NHS, do we think? Um, the NHS is a, is a part of our lives where we have to be very, very careful about language. Uh, if you talk in the NHS about listening to the patient, ensuring patient voice is heard, being better at handling complaints, and all of that, you meet almost no resistance at all to the concept. You, how you actually do it in practice is, of course, another stage of the argument, but nobody denies those things are important. If you say what we need in the NHS is more competition, uh, more vigorous uh, challenge to... Uh, poor standards, enabling people to exit, driving change in the health service. You're saying exactly the same thing mm. in different language, and you get almost exactly a, 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 a response that is almost equivalently unanimous against you. So it's a question of how you use the language uh, to explain what you're seeking to do. And if I can just pick up in order to illustrate the point in a sense, Sonia, you said almost everything you said I agreed with, except when you said uh, you sought to distinguish competition from voice as, as two alternative pressures in the middle ground, which I completely agree with as being the, 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 the big issue mm -hmm. in public services. And if by the word competition you mean something that would have been described by Adam Smith in the 1780s, then yes, I agree with you. But if what we're talking about, which is in the real world what we're talking about, competition for solutions, just en encouraging people to find ways of doing things better, and recognising that all those different decision makers ranged around the service will all contribute to the response to competition, then I think we're in a much more, that that's a more real debate. Adam Smith is dead. Uh, what we're talking about is 10% um, of the UK economy. You're mm. right. It does vary. And what we want is people to compete to improve it. Great. OK, well, I'm going to have one question, and we'll move on to Neil. <laughs> it's an observation, really, because I think we're, I think we're sort of behind the I'm Gar's side. I never know where I'm from, Cambridge. Um, <laughs> we're behind the debate, because if you look at... I mean, I'm nearly 16, and I'm wreathed in Apple products. And our children, and not only our children, our age, we do uh, internet-connected banking, media, music. Uh, and the only bit of our lives that doesn't interact with mobile devices is health. And I think that, I think Neil's about to say something like this. I was, but you said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And Sonia's pink blob of, um, it doesn't have to be consumer activism. Surely it's, it's in the zeitgeist, however you say it. It's the way we live our lives and health isn't there and that's where consumer activism will be. I don't even need to chair this. This is a great, great introduction to Neil. Yeah, please. Oh, thank you. Clutching his apple. <laughs> yeah, sort of, uh, getting smaller and smaller. Um, so I... Um, Steve's got the hardest job because we're all probably saying the same thing in different ways. And I think that's because, as Pam has just pointed out, this is happening. There's not about, it's like saying, were we going to stop yesterday's storm? Are we going to stop it raining? Consumer, <laughs> consumerism of healthcare is a global phenomenon. It's going faster and faster. It will, it is transforming the NHS. Um, and I don't know, with, with respect to my political colleagues, the pol politicians generally do what they think the public want sometimes, as opposed to what they want the public to do, because I would suggest, as you say, um, the vast majority of people uh, seeking health care in the next 20 or 30 years are consumers. They will turn to the internet, they will turn to their devices, they will seek information. And anybody who thinks that isn't happening right now, um, I would suggest is wrong. It's not, as, as sort of many people have said, the future is here now, it's just not evenly distributed. But the always, one of the biggest uses of the internet was health 
information always has been, always the famous number two as opposed to the number one, but it's growing. And just to give one example of that, um, as mentioned, we for five years have run a service allowing the public and patients to rate and review their doctors, their hospitals the, for their dentists. By the beginning, middle of next year, we'll have a million reviews of healthcare, a million ratings and reviews by patients and families of the care they get. A, um, in fact, known to Pam, a, a young, keen, enthusiastic, bright surgeon who works in London thought this was a great idea. Of course I want to be rated and reviewed. Why wouldn't I want to know what my patients and their families think? My whole life is based on serving, as you pointed out, the patients. If I'm not meeting their needs, what am I doing? So this chap asked everybody to, to review him. After the end of the surgery, please help me improve. Just add your comment. Go to this URL. And um, he was recently treating or seeing uh, an 80-year-old gentleman who was coming back having had a Whipple's procedure. And for those who uh, aren't too medical, a Whipple's procedure is a pretty, well, it's as bad as they come, a big, invasive, aggressive operation, pretty much a last-ditch attempt to cure people of pancreatic cancer. And this gentleman and his 75-year-old wife had come back three months later after the operation, and the surgeon had to break the awful news to them that despite going through this operation, the pain, the recovery, the scan showed that the um, tumour had recurred, and he had three months to live. And as he was breaking this news, the lady put, the wife of the patient, put her arm out and touched the surgeon's arm. And he's thinking, hold on, it's meant to go the other way around. I'm meant to put my hand out to you. And she put her arm out and she said, you've been really, really kind, doctor, but we knew you would be because I looked you up on the internet because I wanted to know who was looking after my darling husband. So just sort of stop and think about that for a moment. This isn't just the young, beautiful people like Pam with their, <laughs> their apples and their iPods. As the surgeon said to me, he said, I, I, don't, I didn't think people that old used the internet. And if they did, they might have looked up Imperial, they might have looked up the cancer. They looked up me. Thank God I had some information out there. Thank goodness they could see the reviews from the sort of 40, 50 people who had already seen me and taken the time to go up and give me that feedback. So if in 2012, 2013, we have 75-year-olds desperate to find information about who's looking after their, their loved one, who's waiting for the future, who's waiting for consumerism, and there's all sorts of things we'll talk about in the debate about the voice versus choice, the pressure it exerts. But this is a global change. Um, as I say, we work in 18 countries, in 14 languages now. We see exactly the same issues, exactly the same opportunities. Users of, of services want more and more information. They want to be able to be informed about where they're going. They might not want to have to make a choice. They might want to know that they have got a fantastic GP that their daughter's surgery is going to be done by a superb surgeon. But they want that reassurance. But where it's not good enough, mark my words, people will choose. Uh, people travel 30 miles to go to the, the um, department store they want. They will travel 100 miles to go to a different airport. They will choose their different airline. Who here, if they had the information, would choose to have a substandard GP? If I could give you all the information that told you about your GP, anyone here would choose to have a substandard one? No one. OK. <laughs> Who here, then, is quite confident that their GP is in the top 50% in the country in terms of outcomes, performance, and patient experience? Hmm. So, none of you would accept having a substandard GP, but none of you know whether you've got a good one or not. So what's going on? How does this disconnect get solved? Um, well, this is what the technology allows, of course, because pretty soon you will know exactly. I'm not here to sort of... Um, Oh, yes, oh, great. I'm not here to have a pop at NHS England, but when you publish <laughs> great hurrah and huge expense, the league tables for surgeons, and not one of them, not one surgeon in the whole country is an outlier, you have to wonder how we're helping, <laughs> how we're helping the public. So when we get tables of performance and choice tables, which we will get, because if the, if, um, the government don't do it, it will happen anyway for GPs, Please, please, everyone shout. If there are not 50% of them that are clearly below the average, please shout. If there are not a significant number that are outliers and clearly shouldn't be working, please shout, because you're not getting transparency. You're getting fudged data. So I think the look at, uh, looking at other sectors, obviously, is the um, obvious next step. 
because, to my first point, this isn't something that the NHS is kindly going to do for the public and that the governments are kindly going to do for patients. This is something that the patients and public are going to do to us. They're going to do it to providers. Because pretty soon, if you can't show as a provider organisation, as an individual GP, as a dentist, whatever, that you are providing high standard care, that you are open and transparent, that you embrace the voice as well as other clinical performance data, people will not choose your services. And I think it's going to happen within a few years. It's not going to be a decade. You look at other sectors, TripAdvisor is the obvious model with all its um, problems and deficits, but still, um, 70 million people a month use the service, so it's getting, it's getting something right. Who here has used TripAdvisor ever? So, they're doing something right. It has a value. Um, but more importantly, standards go up. In the 10 years that TripAdvisor has been active in the UK, the quality of hotels, bed and breakfasts, and the services that you, not they, you, the public, rate and review, has gone up and up and up. It's a drive to quality. It highlights excellence, it reveals substandards, and that puts an inexorable pressure on providers to meet the demands of the public. We will do the same thing in healthcare between all of us because it's an unstoppable force. Just to make sure, um, Stephen Kaufer, he's the founder and still the CEO of TripAdvisor, and Stephen, um, you know, he's essentially transformed a global sector. One man and a few other people, but over 10 years has transformed it in 35 countries. Um, sad, very sadly, tragically, his, Stephen's wife died when she was 32 of a neuroendocrine tumour. And so when I met him, I said, you've transformed one sector. It's pretty impossible for a bed and breakfast or a big hotel chain to be rude, dirty, and poison their guests because of the power of users. And mark my words, regulators hadn't solved that problem. Inspection hadn't solved that problem. There were still problems. But TripAdvisor has changed that. I said, um, would you like to join the journey to do the same thing in healthcare. So Stephen now is an advisor to our board, and that's fantastic because it brings a, an experience, a consumerism, an obsessive passion with the needs of the user. And I think when healthcare truly has an obsessive passion with the need of the user, when the NHS realises it's lucky to have patients, as opposed to patients feeling they're lucky to have the NHS, then we will know we're making the right, the right trip. So um, I'll leave a a lot of things perhaps for the discussion. Two things more and then I'll stop. Last week's data that you referred to, the CQC data, hospitals rated between one, high risk or risky, and, and six. Again, let's take it back to individuals. What does that mean to individuals? Um, I was having lunch with my, so sort of friends of my parents. So these people are 67, 68. Again, this is not all 20 year olds whizzing around on their iPhones or their iPads. Um, and they said to me, oh, you'll know about this. We're really worried. The Royal Barks is, is a one. That's our local hospital. Is it really risky at the Royal Barks? I said, uh, yes. Really? Can we believe this? People don't want to believe this. We're going to have to keep pushing and pushing that there is variance. They, and the next thing they said, and this is where consumerization starts to become real, they said, right, where can we go then? Where can we go that is a lower risk? Is the John Radcliffe better? Where should we go? As soon as people realise there is variance, the lives of their children, the lives of their parents, their own lives, can be shaped by their choices. They will seek out information and they will seek out choice. Um, and the next big thing, of course, we've talked a lot about hospitals. A lot of this attention is on hospitals. Um, the mid-staffs, it's easy, obviously, to track when a hospital, relatively easy, to track when a hospital is bad. It's a big building, it sits outside, and you can see how many people go in and go out. You could argue why did it take so long to spot so many of these disasters. And there's only 200 odd hospitals, or 208, 60, 170 trusts, and a couple of hundred hospitals. The big, the big, big news is when you come to GPs. The variance across the quality of general practice, as the King's Fund has pointed out, is huge, unwarranted, and unexplained. Um, once people start to realise that the quality of their GP, witness the point I made earlier, varies, uh, they will demand choice. They will not be happy just to have that local one. They will demand the information they need. And I'll tell you, as soon as people start shifting GPs and the money goes with them, you will see people respond. And the, uh, I think it was the competition 
Commission's research of a few years ago that showed very clearly that where you have competition amongst NHS GPs, so this isn't necessarily independent sector, where you have a higher concentration of GPs competing for patients, the qualities go up, the outcome goes up, and the patient experience goes up. So I'll stop there. As you can tell, I'm a bit of an advocate for the voice of the consumer and competition, and I look forward to being challenged and robustly proved wrong in the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> uh, rising to that challenge are obviously the hospitals, and Steve, you possibly have the toughest job because you, you run one. Uh, you run several, in fact, so uh, please, let's hear, let's hear from you. Perhaps if I can just finish off Sean's introduction of Circle. Uh, for those of you who haven't bumped into us, we're not only notorious for running Hingerbrook Hospital, uh, but we also run private hospitals uh, in which a significant number of our patients are NHS patients exercising their right to choice. Um, we're a new entrant to healthcare in that respect. Uh, we see ourselves as somewhat disruptive to the model. Um, but as Neil said um, in, in passing, the, the biggest worry about being last on a, on a panel in which you largely agree with what's being said is that there'll be nothing left to, to say. So I'll see if I can fill in any blanks as we go along. And of course, I'm delighted to be introduced as a practitioner because when I walk around our hospitals, they regard me as anything but. In fact, despite my natural hands-on instincts, they won't let me anywhere near treating patients. Um, my role, in fact, is to support the clinicians in the front line and make sure that the environment is conducive to them running their services in the way that they believe their patients deserve. Um, so perhaps by way of introduction, I'll say the blindingly obvious, which is, you know, I, I truly believe transparency in healthcare has a vital role in helping us to hold healthcare providers to account. And by that, I mean not only NHS. I know most of this conversation has been around NHS, but also private. Um, and perhaps if there are any distant differences, we can tease them out. And there's no doubt that transparency will enable us to intervene earlier. We only got to think about Mid-Staffordshire uh, um, to understand the relevance of that. Makes it harder to cover up failure. And um, for me, really importantly, makes us less reliant on inspection. I'm filled with horror at the idea that our healthcare standards are being maintained by infrequent inspections of, of bits of paper in our hospitals. Um, at best, that can only be a, a backup reassurance. But, and you knew there was a but coming along here somewhere. Um, transparency alone, however, um, can have both unintended or negative consequences. And we've only got to look at the well-publicised examples of behaviour that arise from FOI, for example, people having conversations that they're not prepared to write down, um, or have you ever come across a defensive clinician, you know, someone who will spend many hours explaining to you how the reason why the, his data is different to someone else's data is because actually there are profound differences in acuity of his patient mix, demographics, and you know, I mean, I've, I've sat there and I've heard it all. And it, what it illustrates is, you know, alone, it isn't going to change the quality of healthcare, and, and I, I would like to therefore move off into a slightly different ter territory. Um, what I believe we need is a culture that allows us to take advantage of transparency in performance to drive continuous improvement. And we start in our organisation with the premise that patients have choice and we have to earn that choice by not only providing excellent services, but by demonstrating that to our patients. And tragically, not all patients do actually have choice. Um, it's a, in, in a sense, all the efforts and technology that we could bring to bear to, to ensure that patients have access to information on, on our services comes to naught when you actually realise that some 80 to 90% of the patients that walk through our door have not a clue that they're entitled to choice in our system. And in fact, they're simply sent by their GPs. And the GPs quite often are referring them simply because it's habit, it's somebody they know, it's the top of the list, you know, whatever criteria comes to mind. And actually, um, those patients who do find their way to us through choice are there based often on recommendations from family and friends and have no ability or interest in analysing any data. Um, but, and this is really important, it doesn't matter that not every patient knows they have choice because what matters is that those of us who run healthcare organisations understand that our patients have an option. So even if geographically there isn't an easy alternative for them, the fact that they have in principle that option is what recasts the relationship between clinician and patient. And so even if in practice that patient isn't going to walk away, we know we have to earn the right to actually treat that patient. So I'll give you an example from our, our, our organisation of how we go about, and I'll use, we go about this and I'll use patient uh, feedback as the example. In our hospital, long before the NHS family and friends 
test came along, um, we, ask, we established a system which we asked all patients in all of our hospitals three questions. What could we do better? You know, what did we do well? And would you recommend us to family and friends? And it's entirely compatible with the net promoter system, which we've, we are also part of and, and very active in. But when we started this in our Hinchinbrook Hospital, for example, we inherited an organisation that was getting about 1,200 bits of patient feedback per year. And it doesn't take long to think about that to realise how statistically insignificant that is. In fact, generally, in, in a system where you're getting that level of feedback, all you're getting is extremely angry and extremely happy, um, and that you're getting very little insight into the general bulk of the services we saw from Sonia's graph. Um, we now get 24,000 um, items of patient feedback per annum, 2,000 a month in, a, in probably one of the smallest district general hospitals in the country. And we publish every single piece of feedback qualitatively on our website, warts and all, good and bad. And for us, this is the equivalent um, of what we would describe as turning the lights on in a messy room. It's not something to be ashamed of if there are patients who aren't happy. It's not in any way, um, when you turn the light on, you see your room is messy. It's not in any way saying the room wasn't messy before. You are in, however, the amazing position of starting to be able to do something about it. And so every single clinical team, and we divide our hospitals into clinical teams, which are independent business units, if you like, led by clinicians. And each of these teams get together regularly, they look at the feedback, they identify issues, and they action improvements. And we publish these improvements and the outcomes on our website and to our patients in the hospital. And in this culture, we empower doctors and nurses to drive improvement, holding themselves and each other to account for the standards they attain. And importantly, what drives this is not external in ex inspection or regulation, but the desire of professionals who've, desi who've joined, and I have to say every professional I've met so far in the health service joined because they wanted to do good for patients. We're empowering them to get on and fulfil that ambition. In some cases, we do have to reconnect them with that ambition because they've had it beaten out of them by a system that hasn't been supportive. Um, and in a similar vein of empowerment, we, we empower every member of our staff to stop the line, as we call it, if they can see the risk of harm to a patient. And this, when, they, when, a pay, when a member of staff does this, metaphorically they pull the cord above the production line, for those of you familiar with the Toyota production system, and what happens is exactly the same as in a car factory, you get a flood of quality experts and support come to, bring, come to bear on your problem, and we figure out, is it safe to go ahead, under what conditions, or should we actually stop? And the important part of this cultural um, initiative is that there is never any blame attached if you get it wrong, you get it wrong. We celebrate team members who put their hands up and stop the line. And staff in Hinchinbrook stop the line several times a week. In fact, in the last year, we've had two never events prevented in major surgery um, by nurses putting their hands up where they disagreed with the lead surgeon in their um, view that they could go ahead and close a patient because they had a full swab count. And those patients were almost certainly alive as a result of that intervention. Um, and over the last year in Hinchinbrook, we've seen a 50% reduction in serious incidents as a result. So empowerment of staff really makes a difference to the quality of health care that you deliver. So I guess in summary, my point is that politicians are always very quick to call for greater transparency. It seems an easy thing because if it, it almost seems as if all you have to do is make performance transparent and that alone miraculously will improve the quality of our health care services. But I think... It's a little bit more complicated than that. And yes, of course, it's about much more data and better technology to deliver it. Uh, but in reality, I think that's the easy part. And to make a real difference, we need to have patients that are more aware of the choices that they can make and a way of dealing effectively with hospitals that naturally fail as a result. And we need to allow them to fail as well because bailing out under performance is not the right incentive behaviourally. And a culture of improvement based on the foundations of transparency, not forced from outside. And more leaders who understand how to create and sustain this kind of culture from within, rather than act punitively from without. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Let's have uh, some questions, thoughts. Chap at the back. The... Um, um, D David Henke, um, freelance investigative journalist and, more importantly, patient carer for uh, my wife who is recovering from a stroke. 
I want to actually passionately support Neil Bacon and give you a practical example where I've used my journalistic skills and things for my wife to get something done. And actually, I'm going to commend the Health Trust as well for the way they handle it. We were left waiting five and a quarter hours for a patient transport from a care, urgent care centre. We, I used my journalistic skills to find out it was a private company that was doing it. I checked with the staff. I then, I'm afraid, treated the managing director of the private company like I do a dodgy politician, sent him a vicious email, and basically pursued them for this bad service. I found the chief executive of West Hearts was on Twitter. So I tweeted her, why aren't you managing this service properly? with a link to my blog, which actually told her what had gone wrong. She, to her credit, um, ordered an inquiry. And the inquiry found, as I suspected, that the, uh, that the firm, Medical Care Services, was not up to the job at the weekend. They were skimping on ambulances. They discovered that actually for most of Hertfordshire, or West Hertfordshire, and um, they only had about two ambulances on for patient transport. And as a result of the report, the management has been changed. The service has been improved. Um, there are now more ambulances on. Staff have been recruited. And the point Neil is making is, and I'm an elderly character as well, um, that yes, you can. I mean, OK, I'm a journalist. But what I would say is you need to simplify I think every chief executive of the NHS should be on Twitter. I think actually, to be fair to the management of the private company, I found his address on, I didn't use nefarious journalistic practices, I found his address on the website so I could get him and I got him at Sunday lunch. You know, so, um, uh, and what you've got to do is simplify it for people because I, even as a journalist who used to cover health, found it very complicated to find out who had commissioned, who had managed, who was running it, and the public didn't even know it was a private ambulance. I had to point out to another, why are you taking a picture of an ambulance for your blog? It's an NHS one. I said, no, it's not. It's got medical services limited on, as well as NHS. So basically, we've got to have a new system that's much more friendly to the thing Neil is talking about. And in fact, I don't see why an NHS England don't tell the entire <laughs> NHS that the chief people should be on Twitter. And basically, the public should have a straightforward way to complain and get something done. Great, very, very pertinent point actually. If you're not, Sonia, uh, an investigative journalist, what, what does government need? Does, is it a job for government or is it going to be organisations like yours that are going to provide platforms? What's going to happen? Well, I, I think it's a systemic issue, um, but the question is how do you get you know, a change in organisational culture? Because that's the point. It's not just about government coming in with its big stick and saying, you know, you must listen to patients. It's about how you change a culture around that. And that's partly about boards and management of um, hospital trusts and stuff starting right at the top. But in a fragmented system like GP surgeries, it's really about the professional culture. And the King's Fund have done really interesting work on this and sort of identified the fact that there is an autonomous artisan sort of professional culture within uh, general practice, which means that it's sometimes hard for um, peer review, feedback to sort of have an impact here. So, you know, one GP surgery could look at another surgery and say, they've actually got a great system in place for listening to patients and, you know, using patient uh, feedback to drive improvements. Because the whole point is, you shouldn't have to really tweet someone to get, you know, you can to, to get action, but there should be good systems in place. Great. So, your chap here. Yeah, um, I'm John O'Connell from the Taxpayers' Alliance. I just wanted to say, I do. Um, I just want to say that um, I think that transparency and more information will drive real big Im um, improvements in quality. But just to play devil's advocate for a minute, if I choose a suboptimal mobile phone tariff or if I go on TripAdvisor and make a bad choice as a consumer, I have a bit less money in the bank or I go to a bad hotel and have an unpleasant couple of nights. The stakes are a lot higher with healthcare. Stephen mentioned this in, in your remarks. Um, I just wanted to ask anyone who had a view uh, of what mechanism you think there should be, if any, um, to correct for the inevitable bad decisions that consumers will make with their healthcare. Stephen? Well, uh, there's two points I want to make. One in direct response to your question and one in, uh, raised by the discussion so far. Uh, how do you deal with bad decisions? Well, uh, what we have to recognize is 
there is a, there's an, one of the contributors to the decision-making process is regulation, and regulation should prevent uh, services being offered which don't meet basic uh, professional standards. That's uh, question one. That's uh, uh, system regulators, CQC, actually much, much more importantly in my view, the professional regulators and the professional ethos, uh, uh, professional accountability. So that's part of the answer. But remember also that a rational patient may make a choice in full knowledge of all the facts and get an outcome that you, with your objective analysis, think is suboptimal. And, but the patient may report that they're completely happy. And so it, it isn't as binary uh, in every case as your question suggests. The other point I want to make, and it's an important one, is that a lot of this discussion is based on the proposition that if you sh turn on the spotlight and show bad practice, somehow something will happen. Well, anyone in the, who's followed the health service history over the last 20 years only needs to remember the words pediatric heart surgery to understand that that was a scandal 20 years old that still hasn't been dealt with. It isn't that we don't know. As Ian Kennedy, who revealed it, uh, Ian Kennedy's summary of that, the real scandal of what happened with pediatric heart surgery at Bristol was not that nobody knew, it was that everybody knew what was going on in Bristol, and for the last, whatever it is, 12, 13 years, everybody has known that the NHS pediatric heart surgery service isn't as good as it should be. And that's not a, divis a, dis a distinction between patients' view of what the outcome is that they want and objective measurement. It's just poor service unaddressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Joe Dilger. I'm an education governance consultant. So I train governing bodies of schools and academies. So my area of expertise is education, not health. Uh, one quick observation and one question. Um, observation is it's just interested in education. Uh, Neil talked about other sectors and uh, students at many schools now, certainly not when I was at school, but do now, often interview, in part, teachers for new jobs. And teachers often going for roles have to do a demonstration class, if you like, teach a demonstration class that forms part of their, if you like, their pitch, their interview uh, for their new role. And and question just revolves around, uh, in the education world, Ofsted, Schools Inspectorate, have published over the last year or so Ofsted data dashboards, which give key information, just like three or four pages on key information, attendance, performance in English and maths. And uh, this is useful for governing bodies that I train. It's available on the Ofsted website for every school. So really, do the panels see uh, enlarged customer voice, more customer activism, that also helping boards of NHS trusts, NHS foundation trusts, exercising their governance responsibilities as well? Would one of you two like to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think... Um, if I can follow Stephen's habit of answering the last question, then coming to that one as well. Because I want to add something. Your point about what happens if I make a bad choice. Well, I think the problem is that right now you're making a completely blind choice, as everyone in this room is, about quality of their GP. So at the moment, you're rolling the dice and throwing them out. So the question is, would having access to the views, the experiences, the ratings of hundreds of thousands of other patients, as well as clinical data, when it was in a format that actually made sense, so the point of what government should do on a lot of this, government should get out of the way because, you know, could the government have built Google? Could the government have built TripAdvisor? Look how they're mangling the friends and family test into a bureaucratic lump. To, I said I wasn't going to do that, didn't I? <laughs> um, but to your point, might I make a bad choice? You, you're making blind choices now. The evidence, and this is the point I was going to come to, because then I want to come to your point. The evidence is really clear on both sides of the channel that if you collect patient experience in a robust, comparative, simple way, so literally ask people to rate and review their care, it predicts mortality in hospitals, it predicts infection rates, it predicts staff satisfaction, and it predicts cost effectiveness. So it provides a real-time smoke detector for the quality of care if done properly. So I think the point is, right now we're making blind choices, how can we improve that? Will it be perfect? Of course not, but to the point that the regulators should be making sure there's a, there's a base level. The other point, in fact, I did, this is terrible, there's another point, Stephen's point that after um, Bristol, same things happen again, same things happen again. And one can't help but look at sort of, you know, the famous quote that if we keep doing the same thing and expecting different results, that's, that's madness. 
And what do we do after each scandal? More regulation, more inspectors. Look at the other sectors. There needs to be a different approach. You can't inspect 11,000 GP practices, and it was, it was your point. You can't inspect 30, 40,000 nursing homes. There has to be a different way. I would suggest the people going through there, there's a million people pass through the NHS every day. They are the inspectors. It's harnessing their voices, their eyes, their ears, because the evidence shows very clearly that that predicts quality. Because if we keep doing the same thing, in another 10 years there will be another scandal, in another 10 years there will be another one. So finally, to the point, which is terrible, <laughs> um, absolutely. We know that there are groups now who are empowered and they find the information they need to make informed decisions. The two that stand out, and if you want to look, go on the internet and find out. Uh, in couples facing infertility, looking for where best to go, they look up the performance, the tables, the outcomes in fine detail. They understand the maths. It's so, as you said, so uh, old-fashioned to think that the public are ignorant and can't handle this information and we should protect them from it. Couples looking for infertility treatment are experts. And you look at the debates on the internet, they are sharing outcomes, sharing experience. The parents of children with serious cardiac abnormalities, probably because of the fact that they know who is more invested in getting a great outcome than the parents of those children, because they know there's variance. You look on the discussion boards on the internet for parents with children with cardiac problems, they are sharing information, they're looking up the information, they're asking for advice from others about what does that mean, what is the outcome, this is my child's problem. It's already happening, and I think the more information we give people, we will feed the active fire that is consumerism, and that fire will warm the NHS or burn it up. <laughs> That's a great thought. Uh, Bill Morgan at the back there. Hi there, Bill Morgan. Uh, I work at a health policy consultancy called Incisive Health, and I was the uh, special advisor to Andrew Lansley for two years when he was health secretary. Um, I wanted to make one observation, really, and then ask the panel um, one question. The observation which um, Neil has just articulated basically is that um, there, are, there are two ways you can improve any service, public services, private sector services. One is through regulation and one is through competition. Now, um, you obviously need both to some extent, but as a conservative I've always felt that competition is more powerful as a lever to improve services. And it's been a source of immense frustration to me to see the debate over the last year, particularly in the post-Francis environment, focus on the extent to which regulation and inspection can improve services. And it's not true. And I think one of the, and I think one of the warnings I think we should we, we should one of the one of the things we should bear in mind is the extent to which um, star ratings, which are now being developed by the Care Quality Commission, they don't empower consumers. It, people may think that they're um, you know they're empowered with information about the quality of services. They don't. They empower the system. They empower the system which designs the ratings, and it fossilizes inefficient patterns of care. So I think that's one of the that's my observation on this debate. My question for the panel is. Um, I, I, don't want, I don't want to burst the bubble that competition is um, great and will improve um, services, which everyone seems to um, agree on. But patients, I mean, patients don't behave as consumers in a lot of areas of healthcare. Um, I'll give three examples of this. One is from polling that Sean and I um, looked at in, um, in, in government, which says that if you ask people, would you prefer to go to a rubbish local hospital or a good hospital further away, they'll actually choose to go to the rubbish local hospital. If, even when empowered with information, they don't make the sort of utility maximizing choice. I've got a personal example of that as well. I broke my ankle last year and I was taken to, I, was, I went to a local A&E. It was an A&E of a hospital I know to be bad, I know to be poor. And I, uh, and I was straight onto the conveyor belt. And even though I knew the hospital to be poor, I never exercised a choice. I never used my elbows to, you know, to get out, to break out of that provider and go to a better provider. And that's me. You know, I, I, was, I was there. I was designing you know, part of a system to encourage choice. And I didn't, I, I, I didn't use it. And then thirdly, I just point to mid-staffs, where everyone knew of quality issues at mid-staffs. But patients still went there, still go there now in their thousands. And we've got to understand, really, how, how we make patients behave as consumers. And it's not just about information. We need to, we need to somehow replicate the competitive pressures, um, which would normally be the case where patients exit, and replicate those pressures and make sure that um, um, uh, providers are being incentivized to deliver good care. So my question for the panel is, finally, um, how do we replicate those competitive pressures? My suggestion, for what it's worth, would be 
to use patient experience surveys, maybe not the friends and family test, Neil knows I've got queries about that, but use patient experience measures and uh, incentivize good quality patient experience because then even if patients don't exercise their threat of exit and they go to, and they go to um, a poor provider, they'll have a poor patient experience and, and providers will suffer as a consequence of giving them a poor experience. And that's, that's my suggestion, but I'd be very interested in the panel's views. I'm sorry let's, for laboring the point. Let's ask a provider. How, how, how would you feel about being penalised potentially on the back of uh, data like that? Um, can I actually start in a slightly different place from that? Please. <laughs> Go back. I mean, there's a number of really interesting points being raised there. I think start with the one of regulation. I mean, I'm a, an engineer by training, so I, I like to see the world through in the, in the form of systems. And my view on regulation is regulation, if you want to run a system top down through regulation, your regulation needs to be at least as complex as the system you're regulating. And healthcare is as complicated a system as I've ever seen in my life. And therefore, it's, it doesn't require a lot of you know, insight to realize why regulation as a means of governing healthcare is not the right way to do it. Um, on the other hand, I think you can take a view around empowerment, that is to say, if it's, healthcare is a professional service, you can run it like a professional service. And whilst that seems to be self-evident to lawyers, um, to media professionals, to you know, advertising people, etc., it does seem to be a bit of a surprise in healthcare at times. But actually, when you empower the healthcare professionals to get out there and figure out whether their services are fit for purpose or not, actually, they do. So I'll give you a good example. When we first moved into Hinchin, but we had a colorectal surgery service, which was um, absolutely not fit for service. It was quite unacceptable and once given the opportunity the professionals who run that service shut it down. Now we've restarted it a year later because we've done all the work necessary to put it back on its feet and with some changes of personnel and a, and a whole lot of investment in quality but it's very hard for, to your point for a patient to look at a system such as a colorectal department and judge for themselves whether it's fit for purpose. So I think that's, I think that's you know, my view on, on regulation per se. I think on competition, I'd go back to choice. I don't think you actually need as a patient to be able to vote with your feet. What you need on the other side is as a professional is to know that that patient does have choice and act in, in the expectation that you have to earn the right to treat that patient in every single instance. And, and just to sort of bring out light to life, again, why it is you have to put your frontline team in a position where they are in that mindset. Um, it, the gentleman at the back earlier who spoke about his campaign to get the service he and his family expected from our health service is clearly media savvy, articulate, um, pushy, all the things that would enable him to get the service he expects out of it. The vast majority of our patients just are not like that. They're frail, they're elderly, they have varying degrees of dementia. Um, they're often not able to judge or, or advocate their own needs. And, and in some cases, their carers aren't in a much better position. And I spent last week, um, as part of a, of a month where all of our senior team were spending days on the front line, testing for ourselves whether the system that I'm describing was working in practice. I spent an hour with a lady who has um, significant learning disabilities and the lead nurse in our organisation who looks after patients like that and helps I'm sure our staff can do that. It took us 45 minutes to get a sense from this patient of her experience in our hospital and, and whether we'd met her needs. And that's with somebody who's extremely expert in asking the right kind of questions to get a conversation going. And one of the things on this patient's passport, which is one of the things that I was really impressed by, it says, tends to answer yes to every question. Yeah. So it's nice to know that at the outset when you're embarking on that conversation. But actually, it brought back to me really clearly how hard you have to work and how much professional competence you need to actually elicit feedback from some of our patients, including, in this case, our lead nurse had designed a patient feedback questionnaire that was largely visual to enable these kind of individuals to give feedback. So it's something we need to bear in this conversation. You know, they're not all Apple phone wielding savvy, articulate, pushy people, although that clearly would have a positive influence if they were. Great, thank you. I'm just being told by my uh, bosses at the back there that I was supposed to finish at 10. Um, so I'm really sorry. I know there are a couple of people here and with hands up, but really great debate. I think that this, this is an area we'll definitely do some more work on. It's, it's really at the frontier of public service reform. And in healthcare, it's probably the most at the sharpest end, because as, as everybody has said, there's passion involved, there's politics involved, but the consumers you know, demand better services, and then you've got the poor provider on the other end trying to make sense of it all and just deliver a great service. So, 
Um, let me please ask you to thank our panel for some great contributions.